Cool. Well, hello. Hi, I'm George, hey. and this is Wolf, which is drummer photographer Drum Hang. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Thanks for everybody getting a hold of me today and putting everything on Facebook. Man, this is this is the first time, and I'm very excited to have Wolf. And before he gets started, I want to let you know that I owe everything to drummer photographer to Wolf. Because Wolf actually started drummer photographer. We're not going to get into the whole thing about that. But he said, why are you shooting all these concerts and all these things when you have all these really cool drummers to do? And long story short, we got rid of the concert website and I became a concert uh, drummer photographer. So, so what's up, Wolf? Good to see you, George. So where are you right now? There's a lot of sun out there. Yeah, um, I am in a specifically Culver City at my girl's place. Well, I guess it's our place now. I've been, I moved. So, you know, I'm by coastal. So I still have my apartment in New York. Um, but I moved whenever I was in LA for however many years, I would always stay at my friend's house in West Hollywood. And you and I have FaceTime from that place. Right. Um, where he's got a Pro Tools rig set up there and a bunch of other stuff. And it's basically his guest house. Um, but uh, when was it? I guess around January. Like right around Nam time, I've moved all my stuff from there here, and I've been. This is so. This has been my LA residence. So like basically, we're we're a bi coastal couple now. So like my new place is our place there, and our West Coast place is our place here. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, I flipped. I flipped my schedule. You know me as a vampire, and um, but I'm actually getting up early these days, and yes, yeah, so you can see lots of light in here. Yes. Palm trees out the window. Yeah. 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 So it suits you. It's it suits you well. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think I, New York. New York was getting to be a, dra uh, a just a, a dark drag for you know a lot of people. New, I've been, I love New York, but New York, the New York that I know has been disappearing steadily and becoming more of just like a corporate, like financial hub. It's a lot of the cool shit just can't afford to stay there anymore. So um, a lot, a lot of the vibe of the city. I mean, it'll always have some vibe, but it's definitely not the vibe it used to be. So, um, and I do so much remote work that I, I don't, act, I don't have to be in New York all the time to, to do what I do. So, and um, I used to hate LA. I've, I've always loved the weather here, but I always hated it here. I hated the vibe, but the vibe has grown on me. And more and more of my East Coast friends are living out here now. So, um, yeah, in the last few years, you've heard me talk about it. I dig LA more and more, and. Yeah, it was only a matter of time. But I always said I was both by coastal, but I was mostly New York. Now it's shifted where it's 50-50. And right now, because of the quarantine, it's, I'm just out here indefinitely. I don't know mm -hmm. when I'm going to be mm -hmm. back to New York. Mm -hmm. so, um, excuse me, I'm going to drink my, my breakfast while we, while we talk. That's right. Me too. I'm going to hide the fact that I'm still drinking Diet Coke. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Got to get a Vitamix to start making coffee. Yeah, food. well, that leads me to my first... Name that name. Luke, what does Luke Hamilton mean to you, Wolf? Oh, good question. Luke Hamilton, I was just thinking about that because my back has been killing me. Luke is an acupuncturist. Well, he's a healer. He does more than acupuncture, but his main thing is acupuncture. And I've had to get all kinds of body work over the years since I started having problems with my hands and my back when I was like 20. And um, Luke is one of the best... He just, you know, wh whatever you do, whether you're a musician or a chef, whatever it is, um, or, or like certain people just have that gift and it's like an innate thing and they're really intuitive. He's, he's just, he's able to like unlock my shit better than pretty much anybody I've seen over the years. So he's been the, the and I've recommended so many friends go see him and, um, and also he's, he's not just, he doesn't do the body work. He also got me into doing Qigong and um, things that I, I was doing a little bit, but he's been pushing me to do more and more. And my, you know, I've gotten taller since just working with him just because my, my, my spine was so bent that he slowly has kind of improved everything. And um, so as long as I'm seeing him like every week or so in New York, I'm straight, but I, did, I haven't seen him in months. I mean, because I remember when the, when I was still in New York, the quarantine started. He wasn't allowed to stay open. So, but yeah, no, he's been a lifesaver for me. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if he's watching, but what's up, Luke? 
Well, we'll, we'll see. Well, he's helped, he's helped me out via you. I mean, I mean, I, I yeah. literally brought this, this Diet Coke on as a prop. There's really nothing in it. It's water. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not. Wolf, is, Wolf has been talking yeah. to me about being healthy for a long time. So, okay, the next name, the next name I want to throw out is Dr. Luke. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Luke, Luke Hashgatwald, one of my oldest friends, one of the first people I met when I first got to New York. Um, when I met him, he was studying jazz guitar, and um, but he was already like ready to take over the world. Even he was like 15 when we met. Um, and then I just watched him go from from that to getting more into to production and writing, and pro, pro, we were all kind of getting into programming. Um, Adam Dorn is another really good old friend of mine. Uh, we all had MPCs. We were all doing besides, you know, Adam was primarily a bass player at first, but Adam got heavy into production pretty young. Luke, same thing. So we all had like a foot in both worlds, like session musician and then like programming and production. And then Luke really shifted gears hard. He got the SNL gig. He was the guitarist in the, in the house band for 10 years. And um, while he was still in the band, he, he, he started having massive hits. First, co-writing with Max Martin, who's a Anybody who listens to pop music knows Max Martin's name, and um, and yeah, and then Luke just had this crazy run of like back-to-back -back number one hits worldwide, and um, and so yeah, a lot of my biggest pop credits are working with him. There were certain things where he would have me on doing additional production, especially when he was still in New York. Um, other things I would just do live drums. Other things some programming. Some things both, and um. So yeah, and I, I learned a lot about production. I mean, I've learned about production from every producer I've worked with over the years, and I've been really fortunate to work with like the best producers in the business. Um, that sounds really cheesy, the best in the business, but they really <laughs> no, are it's so in the business. And um, but yeah, Luke, Luke kind of created a formula. Like he became a guy that like I would hear like to me he's just Lukash, but you know I would run into people and they'd be like, you know, Doctor Luke. Because, like, you know, he really kind of created a blueprint for what the sound of the radio has been for a long time. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, he's like such an old friend that he's like family, but um, I also know who he is, like his stature in the music business, but he's, you know, he's just my boy. So, um, yeah. Because, well, that's the next one I had in line was SNL, so you kind of hit that. Yeah. So, you know. Well, that's, I mean, I've also, I worked on SNL before he was in the band, just with Andy Lennox as a musical guest. And when he was in the band, he they needed a drummer for a sketch. And Sean Pelton wasn't able to do it because the sketch was going into commercial where the band had to play. So Luke, and, and I'm, I've been friends with Lenny Pickett, the band leader, for a long time. So Luke told Lenny, I guess, like, call Wolf. So they had me play a drummer in a sketch. And then... Sean rarely misses a show anymore. I don't think he's, he's missed one show in the last like 10 years or not. So I subbed for him on that. And that came through all those guys. And I have a bunch of friends in that band. And, um, but yeah, SNL is, you know, that's one of those dream gigs. So, um, and Sean really owns that gig and he's been playing the shit out of it for, for over 25 years, but it was fun just to sub. So, yeah. So tell me how t tell me how the, how the Seth Meyers uh, thing came on. Um, that came pretty organically. Um, Eric, who is a great drummer himself, who's one of the show's producers. Um, I th I think it was his idea when they made some changes in the band. Instead of just getting a new permanent drummer. Um, to just have different drummers, and I might be messing this, the backstory up a little bit, but just to have, I think at first he just reached out to some of his friends, because he, he's, you know, he, before he was doing that, he was playing with, with uh, like, a major label artist and had endorsements and all that stuff, so he, and I think he was living out here, so he was already friends with a lot of, like, named drummers from being on the road, so I think he started having his friends and then just started reaching out, and he just had a, like a, a list of drummers. And then eventually I met him in New York at Main Drag Music. And um, 
Scott, do you, do you have a reflex pad? Have we no. talked about the reflex uh, So It's been a while. So anyway, um, I want to say that Guy, who is the guy behind reflex pads, was tight with Eric. And I think that was the first time that Eric was through Guy. But then we stayed in touch on social media. And just one day he DM'd me and was like, you want to come do the show sometime? And he gave me a list of dates. And I was happy to do it. And it was a lot of fun. Really, really good people. Um, any any TV gigs I've done have been pretty like cush gigs. So, but that's a whole that's a whole other level because it's um, they they really make you feel like part of the, the, the family because any band becomes a family after a while. So right. it, it was it was really cool. But it's it's a really good hang. The band is is great. The MD is great. Um, Eric's a great producer. Seth Myers is really cool, very friendly, and and. Um, yeah, it's a really warm atmosphere there, and it's a lot of fun, and it's it's not a lot of pressure because um, they, they they have a system down where you every day you're you're literally writing songs for you know the commercial going in and out of commercials um, that day, but they have it set up so uh, we don't really need charts. I won't go into detail how to how to do it, but but it's it's they found a way to do it so it's very low stress. The only the only issue I had is I hate wearing in ears and I wanted to wear headphones over the ears, but they were like, yeah, we're yeah, you we don't do that. that. He, you know, you know JoJo. Have you had JoJo on? Not yet, not yet. So, guy, um, is kind of, I mean, he's his own drummer, but I I don't necessarily want to say he was JoJo's protege, but like I know he. Does a lot. He can do a lot of the same, like otherworldly, like inhuman drum shit, like JoJo does. But, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, guy, guy's been in a bunch of bands. He's worked with people like Phil Haswell. Like he's, he's so humble. Like I met him through Adam Dorn, who I talked about before. Adam is also a motion worker. That's Adam's uh, former DJ name. But Adam introduced me to Guy online. Guy reached out and wanted. I think Guy was in this band. I think, what are they called, VHS or Beta, that Adam had produced? I don't know if you remember them. They were a big indie band. Anyway, um, he was like, yeah, my, this is my boy Guy. Guy was so humble. I had no idea his like his resume and all the shit he'd done. So, Or that he could play so great. But I don't know if you remember, I briefly had a, a practice room at Williamsburg. That came through Guy because he had a room there. And, um, yeah, guy, guy has ridiculous hands so, and feet. Okay, I'm not yeah. the reflex guy. I'm the guy from Spina Ball, the symbol spinner. Sorry for the oh. confusion. I'm enjoying. Oh, sorry. Well, I can't pronounce his last name anyway. Sorry, guy. Let that's, me look here. That's a bad thing. You can't you you can't see it, and I I don't know how to do that. Yeah, oh, I can see it now. Okay, can you see it? Okay. Oh, oh, Ken Hawks. You used to have long hair. What happens? Uh, I shaved my head. Is what happens. Um, yeah, I had long hair for years and, um, it was getting like, just scratch. I still have hair, but it was just looking thinner and thinner. And it reached that point where I was like, do I want to be that like old rocker with like the scraggly hair or, and I never liked my hair because it didn't have any body. It just hung there. I had to like, you look like you have like wavy hair. My hair was just, was just flat and I had to put a shitload of product in it to do anything. I never liked it. So when when it started to look i was looking like kid rock and i never i thought his hair looked kind of cheesy so um i buzzed it and then i had a mohawk for a while and then i shaved the mohawk and that and then i just i was buzzing it short and then one day i just got a razor and said fuck it and started shaving it uh, and i'm much, much happier this way you've got to look okay lisa maxwell ah lisa maxwell i call her my adopted sister they're we're not blood relatives, but I met Lisa at Berkeley. Lisa, people know her now for her shiny, that's the big band record that I was really happy to be part of recently. Lisa, I met her at Berkeley, and I think, I forget the name of the ensemble, but um, I was a scholarship student, and at being in the scholarship program, you had to play for, and there was a big band where you would play arrangements for, I guess, arrange, students who were writing arrangements, something like that. But I remember if I'm, this is also 
30 some years ago, so I could be getting it wrong, but I'm pretty sure I played one of her big band arrangements in that big band. And um, I was painfully shy back then. I was very stunted. Like I was a depressed kid and which ended up being great for practicing because I just put everything into, into studying and practicing and gigging when I was really young. So by the time I was in my late teens, I had a lot of shit together on the instrument, but personality wise, I was, I was, yeah, not a lot of shit together. So, um, so I was painfully shy, but she luckily was like very friendly and we became friends and she was really tight with Hiram Bullock. And I was a huge fan of Hiram's and I guess Charlie Drayton had, was about to leave or had recently left Hiram's band. And, um, and I think Ricky Peterson also on keyboards had left. So she told me that Hiram was looking for a drummer and a keyboard player. So um, she recommended me and Dave DeLome. And we both ended up eventually joining Hiram's band. And I, Hiram was flying us in and out of Boston to do gigs on the weekends. And I basically stopped going to classes. And I just finally dropped out at the end of that semester. Um, but yeah, Lisa, Lisa really got my foot in the door in the whole New York music scene because I didn't know what I was going to do. I, if I, I knew I wasn't going to graduate. I went to Berkeley to network. Um, that's when I first really fucked my hands up and started having hands and and draft problems. But, um, I was able to rehab and like start playing again. And I knew I was going to either move to LA or New York and just like dive in. And, uh, but yeah, so Lisa introducing me to Hiram really changed my life. And, um, and she's also just a great friend, you know, over the years. And, um, like, she's another person that I consider family at this point. Um, yeah, and I'm really proud of her because she's she's been an incredible... So she was... I, I knew her as a sax player also, and that's the side thing, is she, t- at Guns N' Roses, the original Guns N' Roses, at their peak, when they were doing stadium tours, she was part of their horn section. So she, she toured in the 90s, world tour with those guys and i remember hanging out with them with her but uh but yeah for years she's she's been doing uh composing and arranging for tv and film and she finally and people have been encouraging her to do her own big band record and it was kind of in the vein of the gil evans monday night orchestra and um so yeah that so her record it was kind of a tribute to Lusolop, the amazing new york staple who passed away was also part of the Gil Evans scene. And I was really lucky through Hiram getting to, to sub for Ken with Denard, who was the main drummer at the time when I moved to New York, because they used to have a Monday night residency at this place, Sweet Basil. And that that was a great way to get my ass kicked playing in that big band whenever they needed me. So, But yeah, that Lisa really definitely changed my life. So I don't know if he's watching, but what's up, Lisa? Well, Tony Lewis says, hey, Wolf. What's up, Tony? He's another monster drummer. And since I'm giving trivia out, Tony, yes. you know the movie Aim? Yes, we all do. I could, I could be getting this wrong, but I'm almost certain Tony is the... Uh, there's like in the big beginning of the movie, there's a scene where you see a, a drummer playing a kit. And I'm almost sure... Is that you, Tony? I'm pretty sure that is Tony. Let me see. I don't know if you're still watching, Tony, but uh, if you can verify that that is, in fact, you in the movie Fame, I'm pretty sure it is. So... So many great drummers went to that high school, like um, Tony, Coogee Bell, Omar Akeem. I could be getting this wrong. Uh, I think Charlie Drayton, Larry Aberman, or Aberman. I never. I, put, I, put I say it both names. ways, so. It's... Yeah. <laughs> um, have you had? La- have you talked to Larry yet? No, not yet. I these are all guys. You, these are all guys you should interview on I'm... the show because they all have amazing careers. Um. Well, I mean, for me, because I was just so focused on music and I was lucky that um, in Philly and in, around Philly and Philly suburbs, there, there's always been a lot of talent. So like the bands I was in, I was in a fusion band and I was in like an R&B and original, like original and covers R&B rock band. And um, like Billy Mann, who's gone on to be a huge name in the music business, also one of my oldest friends. I was in a band with Billy and Adam Dorn, who I mentioned, and uh, the other guitarist in that band is named Clayton, or Clay for short, and 
I had lost touch with Clay, and then he hit me up on Facebook, I don't know how many years ago, and he was like, hey, man, you live in New York, right? And I was like, yeah, he's like, uh, do you want to come? I'm playing with Jay-Z at the Barclay Center tonight. So he's like a first-call guitarist on all the big hip-hop and R&B tours. So, yeah, and then also Kurt Rosenwinkel, who's gone on to be a major jazz uh, guitarist and composer. We were in a band together. Um, that was a fusion band I was in. So, yeah, I was very active in music. Also, my high school music program w was decent. It wasn't amazing, but I learned most of my really great music shit was outside of school. And um, so, and then my father played music as a hobby. I mean, he did some professional stuff, but it wasn't his main thing. But, like, so he would get me playing on like wedding type gigs when I was still in junior high and high school. And then I was gigging with my, with, with the band, with my friends by the time I was in my like uh, mid teens. And, um, and also like, I was not, like I said, I was a depressed kid. I mean, I was also a depressed adult for a long time, but, um, I really just seemed pretty withdrawn to people who didn't know me, but I, I had this like really deep inner world. And most of that was music. And, I, everybody I know that got really good at a young age, I think, has a similar background where, you know, we were all a little off um, in our in our lives, but we could just use that to just, like, dive deeper into music. And also, I, I went through puberty really late, so, like, I wasn't even, like, I wasn't dating or doing any of that shit. Like, every, um, I didn't even get tall till, like, my senior year of high school. So I went from, like, not having any kind of social life to like my last year of high school, like everything kind of came together. I, I grew, I was uh, gigging a lot and had my first girlfriends and, um, and then re went straight from there to Berkeley. And then from Berkeley, at the time when you're young, everything seems like it's taking forever. But when I look back, like from 17 to 20, I went from like worshiping all these New York musicians. And by the time I'm in 20, 20, I'm in New York working in bands with these guys and also comp competing for gigs with my drum heroes which was really fucked with my head for a long time yeah the whole imposter and you did it um it's 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 an ongoing thing it's i've managed to get it like in check over the years and i said like working with people like there was a guy named richard zukowski who is as far as i know still in massachusetts who was treated like uh john medeski dave Kuzinski, um mike regard a bunch of other like boston people um, and he, he's the guy that got me eating healthy to begin with and got me into stretching and breathing and, um, like turned me on to, to like Eastern healing. And, um, and, and then there were other people over the years, but the next person, like I mentioned, we talked about Luke Hamilton, like having people like that helps keep the tendonitis in check. So, but, um, but yeah, so no, when I all like, that really started when I was 20. Right. Like, just as my career was about to, like, pop off is when my hands and back started right. fucking with me. Right? Yeah. They were like, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're, you can quit music. And fortunately, I ran into Dave Kuczynski, who was at New England Conservatory at the time, but was playing in the band with my friend Alpha Hanish, a Berkeley drummer, um, Screaming Headless Torsos. Some people might know them. Mm -hmm. Amazing band. They're still together. Um, I think Gene Lake. No, no. Uh, Joe Joe's been the, been the drummer. Gene Lake's been the drummer. Adrian Harpin's played drums. I was the first drummer in New York after Al was no longer in the band. And um, I think Biscuit, New York, great New York drummer, is the drummer now. Danny Sedonik plays percussion. Um, Tima Efron, I believe, is still playing bass. John Modeski used to play with them. A lot of great people over the years. But um, Fuse was the one that told me, fuck that. Don't listen to the sports doctor. Fuck Western medicine. Go see the sealer. It's going to sound crazy to you, which it did at the time because I, I wasn't exposed to any of that shit. And this is also pre-internet, you know, it was a very different time. But yeah, he, he got it, so I was able to work. But I mean, I was on the road for like 10 or 11 years, like starting when I was at Berkeley, and I was in pain the whole time. So, um, which is one of the one of the reasons that I decided to like just in 2000 just quit touring and do session work. But also, I was as my main got out there more from touring with bigger artists i started getting calls for better sessions or not better but just you know higher profile sessions and um and the, the money got better and i was also i i'd been into programming i got my first drum machine in, in high school so um 
and that like I was getting work doing programming too. And um, in 2000, it was like the, the, the golden era of session work was kind of over, but I knew between drumming and programming, I could carve out a niche for myself and be able to afford to stay off the road. And that's, that's what I did. And, and um, yeah, and I, I don't miss touring life. I really don't. I was not, it was great. And there's so many great things about it. I had too many to list. Um, but I, I really don't miss touring. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's helped you with everything else that you've done going, going when you started, first started programming. hundred percent. Yeah. It's helped you with everything. I mean, you, you, I mean, it, you, you, you know, the whole scene, you, you know, people that are actively in it. You work with people who are actively in it. It, it, uh, it, it definitely gives you a confidence. I remember the first time I played a really large venue and there's, there's, it's a, it's a different kind of pressure when, cause you know, as a drummer, you're essentially, if, it, if you're playing backbeat bass music, you are the leader of the band. Even if you're not the MD or the lead singer or whatever, you're, you're leading the band. You, you are setting the pace, the dynamics, the intensity. Like if anybody else stops playing, the show doesn't stop. If the drummer stops, everything kind of stops. So, um, and the first time you play a really big room where you hear your drums coming at you, like reverberating through like a, an arena, um, you have, it's something you kind of have to step up into. And then, it, and then you, it just gives you a certain type of confidence that I took with me to, to set to sessions. And I, to this day, I still do. And also I've toured with so many different in, within different genres and playing with all these great musicians and, um, yeah, there, there's so many tools, musical tools I picked up along the way and also communication skills because on, on the road, you're, you know, you're spending a very small amount of time relative on stage relative to how much time you're hanging with people on the bus or in airports or where, whatever. And, um, and that's also important for recording, like to, to, to have your people still together. So, I mean, with remote recording, not as much, but still, so yeah, I, I, I do, and also I got to see the world because I didn't really travel that much as a kid. So. Grover Washington Jr. Yeah. Um, Grover is somebody that I really wish I had been a little old. I mean, it was great to, to be so young. I was in my early 20s when he hired me, but I was just kind of really starting to grow into myself, I think right around the time he passed and I think he passed in 1999 and um I loved playing with him loved the whole band and his family was amazing and they treated you like family um and I grew up in Philly where he, you know he was like a legend and like everybody else I'd seen that show um it was like the wine light tour and he did a, a, a special with uh like Richard T Steve Gadd Anthony Jackson Ralph McDonald and let's say Eric Eric Gale, right? Eric Gale. But it was like, yeah, I think it was, it was all those, those it, was that, it was that whole family that was yeah. actually in the CTI and, world. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I, you know, I grew up like listening to that stuff. And so getting, getting to play with him, even though I was already in New York, I was going, you know, my family still lives in Philly. So I would go back there and rehearse. And, um, and at that point I didn't even have to audition. I had done enough stuff that, um, Pablo Batista, the percussionist in Grover's band um, recommended me. Let me get my laptop back up. Um, and the first time they called, I was actually working with a band called Tribal Tech, and which is a, an LA fusion band with Scott Kinsey, uh, Gary Willis, and Scott Henderson. And that I got that through knowing Kinsey and Lisa Maxwell because she had a connection with them, but mostly Kinsey because he was playing keyboards right after Berkeley with them. And um, I. I was just filling in because their drummer, Kirk Covington, had left the band briefly. So, um, but I still, like, I won't just bail on a gig in the middle of the tour. So I had to pass on the Grover thing. But then the guy they got didn't work out and they called me back again and were like, do you want to do the gig? And um, so I jumped at that. And um, I worked with him on and off until he passed. And unfortunately, at that point, he was so well established in his career. And, he, you know, having that Bill Withers duet just the two of us was a big crossover so he was playing he was headlining much bigger venues than most jazz artists would 
So he, he could go out and just do, do like three months a year and do his circuit and do like headline the Playboy Jazz Festival and whatever. And he, he hated flying because he had problems with his ears um, and the air pressure, I believe. So we didn't really do much overseas shit. It was just every year we would just tour the States and maybe Canada and do the Canadian Jazz Festivals. And it was great, but I couldn't pay New York rent for three months of work a year. So, and there was no retainer. So I would live off of the money from however long we were out. And then I would have to like take other work. And then I remember I took, I got the Annie Lennox gig when, when Grover was, was on break. And then it, that led to a conflict, and I had to pass on touring with Grover for a year to, to do her gig, which was an amazing gig. Um, but yeah, Grover, the thing is, when, when I was saying earlier, I wish I had been a little older. I was such a fusion head at the time, and was so it was like my first time having my own full-time drum tech. And um, Gibraltar had been sending me these huge racks. And my drum tech w was like a drummer himself, and he was encouraging me to make my kit bigger and bigger, and I had the electronic shit. So I remember being out with like a double bass kit with a huge cage and um, two snares, all my pads, multiple hats, all that shit. And, um, and Grover liked it because Grover, you know, Grover had already done the CTI shit, you know, like, right. so he wanted his sound to, to sound newer and fresher. But I, like, now, like, there will be these Grover reunion shows where it'll be Grover's old band and like Najee or Gerald Albright or other people like that will, will, will play Grover's parts. And now I approach that gig more with that sound somewhere in between Harvey Mason and Gad mm -hmm. and um, with a small kit and just, just pocket a more dry drum sound. But back then I was really going for it. And um, Frank, you know, who Frankie Tano is, He's, a, so. he's an amazing UK drummer. He's uh, played. He was with Amy Winehouse at her peak, touring with her. He right. played with George Michael and a Jack Bruce, but like a, too too many names to list. But we became friends when I was doing a, a tour with the UK band, and w there were some gigs where he was in the opening act, and we became friends years ago and have stayed in touch. And he just hit me on WhatsApp last night and totally made my night because he took a screenshot of, a, of an album called Grover Live that um, Jason Miles, who's another producer I work with, got a hold of some unreleased Grover board tapes, I believe, and uh, got that released. So it's called Grover Live. I'm on drums on that. And I can't listen to it because I, I cringe because that I hear myself. The kit's too big. The sound is too bright of my drums. And... Um, I'm not really overplaying too badly, but I still feel like I'm overplaying. Mm -hmm. And um, but he was like, "Hey, man, I didn't even know you were on this record." He said, "I was listening to this on my car, and I didn't even know it was you until in one of the songs, Grover's introducing the band, and I heard your name, and he was saying how great I sounded." And I was like, "Man, I, I can't even listen to that." But like, <laughs> but you, you made my night. So, but yeah, no, I like I Grover was great, and it was such a great band to play with, and Grover was such a great guy. But uh, I, I, I hate the way I approach the gig now. Yeah. So, you know, let's, yeah. So, you know, let's, yeah. J.D. Blair's on, and Aaron Comas said, great, great, great stuff, Wolf. Oh, what's up, Aaron? Aaron's another guy I go bit way back with to Berkeley. And Aaron, yeah, Aaron's another person who was like, by the time he was at Berkeley, we were all teenagers. He was already amazing. And, um, I think Aaron was one of the few people to get eights. There's this whole thing. There's a Berkeley rating system. And um, there are these, like, legends that nobody gets straight eights. Like, eight is the top you can get. And I, I remember hearing rumors that, like, this, this kid Aaron got straight eights. But uh, Aaron was already, like, a fully developed, like, well-rounded drummer, like, at Berkeley. And then, um, yeah, and then moved to New York also. And then the Spin Doctors blew up. And he's had a great career. An amazing drummer. Um, uh, does a lot of great session work too. Really good dude. But yeah, what's up, Aaron? Um, so yeah, and I know you're friends with Aaron. Oh yeah. You've you've, you've, stu you've done some online lessons with him, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's I've had him on here. He's <clears throat> yeah. He's uh he just got done two. He's got two uh two albums in the uh, done. Um, Steve Forbert. You remember Steve Forbert, Wolf? Yeah. Yeah. I he do. just got he just got done playing. He he did that album. It's yeah, a, it's really really good. I hadn't heard of Steve Forbert for a long time, so yeah, he's. I yeah, I remember being. I remember when I was a kid hearing that name. Yeah, me too. Same same thing. Yeah. So.
Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where it's like a, it's blessing and a curse for like kids of this gener, like younger musicians now. Um, like pre YouTube, you really had to like do your own work to figure out how to play shit. And that's how people develop their own style because we all got it wrong. I remember having vinyl and like Billy Cobham was, I listen to everybody, every, you know, all the, the greats, but when I was in high school, it was Billy Cobham and Tony Williams were probably, and Gab were the, the three people I was studying the most, I think. And, um, I just would put the vinyl on, put my finger on the turntable to slow it down just enough. And it's not like now where you can time stretch it. It would it would slow down and like bring the pitch down. So it was kind of hard to hear what was going on, but I would transcribe the shit and I'd be guessing um, how like what I think the sticking and the footing is. And if it's a really fast drum thing and if it's an old recording, there's some stuff that you don't know. Is that a ghost note on the snare or is that a ghost note on the kick? It's just like it's a lot of notes at once. And that's how you develop your own shit because you're just you're guessing and you're getting it wrong at the time, but you come up with your own thing. And um, and chops weren't like as ubiquitous. Like I don't consider myself a chops guy anymore, but I was definitely a chops guy when I was at Berkeley. And um, and it was kind of rare. Like not everybody had a lot of chops. And now, like I see fucking ten year olds with like more chops than like anybody I knew back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so, it's it's so much easier for, for people coming up now to learn and not just YouTube, like you can get a Skype lesson and you can go straight to the source. You know what I mean? You, you can hit Steve Gadd up now mm -hmm. on um, what's, I just heard he's going to be on and I'm playing a meat hook, which is, which is like a, um, where you, you can uh, do like online consultations. And um, yeah, so you can, you can actually ask Steve Gadd himself, what's the exact sticking in 50 ways. Right. So, Right. Um, and yeah, and if not, you can find a thousand people playing it. I'm exaggerating. However many people breaking it down on YouTube. So, so it's great. The information's out there. It's easier than ever. And very, it's cheap. Like I, you know, you, you, you bought vinyl. I remember having to like spend a fortune on bootlegs, on vinyl bootlegs, just so I can get this one recording of Sly and the Family Stone to hear how Greg Erico played this one thing. And, and um, so, um, yeah, it was a lot, but I feel like we really, we all had more personality to our playing because of that. And now so many people have chops, but it, it's just all starting to sound generic. And um, I would agree. I, I, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, Aaron and I. So, yeah. Daniel East, you always sounded like yourself, dude. Even when you were oh. a kid, I could hear that. It was you. That's really cool. Um, uh, what's up, J.D. Blair? So I'm just looking at the comments. Yeah, uh, so Daniel East. Um, so I mentioned Billy Mann. So their brothers, East and Mann is not their exact last name. I'm not going to give away what their, their family name is. But um, yeah, so I remember they had a house, I want to say in Center City, Philly. Maybe it was South Philly, but I'm pretty sure it was Center City. And in the basement, Danny or Daniel had a brand new Tama kit with like power toms. I'm pretty sure it was power toms. I want to say superstars. Is that, are you watching Daniel? So, um, and I remember Zoom, he, we could have, we could, the, the screen would be yeah, cool by now. Yeah, exactly. But, um, and he was really cool because we, Billy and I and different, whoever was in the band at the time, we would rehearse in their basement. And Dan, Daniel could have been like, no, like, go get off my drums, kid. But he was like, yeah, man, feel free, make yourself at home. And so that was one of the first pro kits I ever played because I didn't, you know, I came up with good drums, but like all secondhand, like 60s stuff because we're talking the 70s and then the 80s. I eventually saved up. I washed cars for three years on my dad's car lot um, and saved enough to eventually get a double bass uh, new superstar kit because that's what Cobb used at the time and I really wanted to be him. Um, but yeah, Daniel's kit was like one of the first pro kits I ever played and really good dude. And also a really talented musician. And, um, I think he does a lot of sound work now too, if I'm not getting it right. Yeah. He's saying yes, sir. So, um, yeah. And Daniel lives in, are you in Florida now, Daniel? I think, think he is, but, um, we have, it's just, it's funny cause music is such a community. Like Daniel and I have a lot of mutual friends, but yeah. 
like our paths have like were so spread apart over the years. But yeah, um, yeah. So uh, Daniel, thank you for being so cool and letting me play your drums back in the day. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot I said that. Yeah. Well, the way I do it, it is because I I do it. Um, I do everything on like within the box now in Pro Tools. So I either do grid, grid programming where I import my samples in and fly them around on the grid and then mess with it that way, or I'll use, I'll do it via MIDI with like addicted drums, say if I want to program like virtual acoustic drums. And I'm just doing that with a mouse. I don't even use a pad controller most of the time or, or a MIDI keyboard controller for most of the time anymore. So when I came up, I, for most of my earlier career I was using MPCs first a 60 then a 3000 for years and um with that it's a little more real time you're playing you hear the beat as you're going and now I don't really I don't do it that way anymore so you now it's like I'm just adding color and texture like painting and it's not till I'm done that you can press hit the space bar and you hear it and you're like now you hear the, the groove so it's that you don't get that real time immediate satisfaction like an NPC or really playing a kit. So, um, but even the way I record kit now, a lot of times it's, it's also more and more like that, where it's, it's almost like drum production where we'll say just certain producers want separation. So we'll just do like the kick and the snare separately and then overdub the hat or a ride or whatever. And, um, and then go back and overdub fills and we're just construct and then we might beat detect it and then edit the parts because we're going to be mixing we want it on the grid because we're it's, we're adding it to programming and everything that sync a certain way mm -hmm. so yeah i that's kind of how i think of myself now it's just kind of like a, a, a rhythm maker slash producer yeah. and even if i'm not the producer on the record i have to think in terms of production when i'm cr like crafting mm -hmm. um or my friend Camus, who's a um, he does a lot of things now, but I, when he first blew up as a producer, but he does a lot more than produce now, but, um, we went to Berkeley together also. And he, he was a drummer who got into programming way ahead of everybody. Like, I mean, I, I was programming them, but I remember seeing him walking around with a briefcase full of like, I want to say floppy disks, whatever the technology was at the time with, with the sample library, which was back then at Berkeley, you didn't see that. So he was way ahead of, ahead of the curve with that. And, um, but he rec he's he now lives across the street from me in New York, and we haven't seen each other in a while. And he's been having me work with some of his artists, and um, I think he called me like a drum sweetener, like like where the drums are already done on a lot of these things, where they're mostly programmed, but they'll have me come in and just sweeten what's there. And it can be a combination of live and programmed, or just programmed, or just live. But um. So yeah, I, that's I'm seeing like more and more of my work kind of turning into that. Yeah, <clears throat> where where I'm like the fixer or something. Um, well, I should say that that was posthumous. Like I, Bowie's one of the people that I always he was on my bucket list when he was alive, um, but I I didn't see any way I would work with him as a drummer because. For the last however many years of his life, two friends of mine, Sterling Campbell and Zach Alford, were basically trading that gig back and forth. So, and they both killed that gig. So I didn't see any reason why they would ever call me. Um, but I did think um, Mario McNulty, who's a good friend of mine, who's a producer, dr great drummer in his own right, but a producer and an engineer, was Bowie's engineer for a long time and eventually started producing stuff with Bowie. And, um, and Mario has hired me as a drummer and even more so as a programmer for a lot of stuff over the years. And we've collaborated, we've co-produced stuff together too. But um, I, I figured if, if I was ever going to work for Bowie organically, maybe it would be if like he did another record and, and I got called to program for it. But I never saw a way where I would actually play drums with Bowie. And then when Bowie passed, um, that before he, when he was still alive, he, there was one record he did before he got sober. I think it's, it's it Never Let Me Down. I think it's the name of the record. And um, Bowie just ne didn't like it because it, it was not his best work. Even though the vocals were great, just the production, 
you, you can, it just sounds like there was a lot of partying going on and it's, it just wasn't, I understand why he didn't love the record. So he and Mario went back and I guess kept the vocals. I could be getting it wrong. I don't know if Mario's on here, but, um, um, oh, dang, it's the cleaner. <laughs> um, so, um, Bowie asked Mario to like reproduce one of the tracks from that record because he was like, I always thought this record could have been, the songs are great, I just hated the production, or I'm paraphrasing. So they did it, and Mario had like his guys from that, his band at that time, like I think Sterling came in and played Kit and whoever else. And um, Bowie loved it, and I think that was used on, on a compilation or something. And Bowie, in the, in the liner notes, I could be getting, I'm probably butchering the story, Bowie said something like, would love to re at some point to, to revisit the whole album this way. Cause he was really happy with what Mario did. So after, and Mario and Bowie were really tight. And then after Bowie uh, passed, I, um, I guess it was the label, the management, and also like Bowie's like family, I guess their estate um, reached out to Mario and, and said, do you like, we're going to be putting out a lot of stuff. And this is something that, that David always wanted to do. Can you finish, this record the, the way you started it on that one track and just do the same process. So, um, and he wasn't allowed to talk about it with there. It was basically an NDA situation. Um, and, um, but he told, but he told me like, he, he just said here, I, I can't talk about it publicly, but I'm, I think I'm going to be doing this thing. And there are some tracks that really need programming. And, even though they were only supposed to use people from Bowie's band in his circle, he was like, I'm going to add, I'm going to get approval to bring you into programming to program on it. And so he got approval. And so I worked with him for a while to get that done. And there was one song where it's all me programming. And then another song where I did programming, Sterling played some live drums. And, um, and it was, you know, it, it's the closest I could get to, I mean, I'd see Bowie walking around, yeah. Lita and stuff right, right. like in the village but like i never worked with him and um so yeah but i remember like when when i went to mario's studio his home studio to work on it and like you know it's something i've done you know you sit in front of pro tools you're soloing tracks whatever but like soloing david bowie's vocal tracks it's you know it's chills yeah so that, was that was that's really cool i'm really proud of it even though like i said i don't want to I don't want to make it like I worked with him when he was alive, but it's, it's, you know, it's still cool to have on my resume and, and it was just a really cool project to work on. So, I mean, how many, and, how many people get the opportunity, number one, to be on it? And number two, to sit there and actually listen to his voice in your headphones well, as you're working. It's like, yeah, well that, and also to, to try and do it justice because I, that's the main thing. The whole spirit of the project was, this is something that, that Bowie really wanted. Mm -hmm. And, and, like and when you compare the original to what Mario did, it's it's like that was the record that Bowie really wanted, and so that I'm proud that like like the best compliment I could have gotten was Mario saying like yeah David would really dig when you program on this like this is the kind of shit he was into so I'm I'm paraphrasing I don't remember exactly oh, yeah, how it yeah, was, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. basically he was like yeah this is what he would have wanted so that's that's all I wanted to do was just kind of do do it justice so oh yeah. So this is um this is that that uh, Phantom Focus E Chair which I posted out which is the shit. Um, it's 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 like you know you've seen my setup in New York. It's a much bigger version of this. I have a desktop computer, a right. bigger interface, huge monitors, and a much bigger table and uh, MIDI controller and a bunch of other shit. Um, this is it's a new 16-inch MacBook Pro with a bunch of upgrades underneath it. I have a couple glyph drives. I've got these like little, but surprisingly powerful Genelec 8010s, I think they are. And a very straightforward plug and play M audio interface. Cause I'm, this is just, I'm just working in the box here. It does have a decent mic free if I needed to record something, but um, I, I basically don't ever for at least out here, since I'm just programming, all I need the interface for is just to have my monitors hooked up and headphones. So 
Um, I've got a USB-C hub here and a wireless keyboard and mouse in space gray. It looks cooler. Um, yeah, and it's 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 a it's a bit of a shift going from a 27 inch display to the 16 inch display, but it's fine. And um, yeah, it's I I finally you know people who um, I mean George you know that I didn't have good, uh, internet here for uh, until a couple of weeks ago. We had to switch providers. Now it's blinking. But when I first got the rig set up, I couldn't even download and install any of my shit. So. But uh, I got it. like stuff like Spectrosonics, which are huge downloads. Um, so yeah, I got everything installed, and um, yeah, it's 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 all and it's also portable. You know what I mean? I just pull the laptop out and leave all this shit here, and I can work anywhere. So it's uh, yeah. yeah. So so yeah, the only thing I can't do here is play drums, and um, I I don't know when I'm gonna play a kit next because I, I really only cut drums in commercial studios whether it's remote right. or an actual session but um yeah i don't know when it, when i'll feel good about being in a room full yeah. of people um, yeah. So, yeah when when people uh ask me if i can track live drums on stuff now i just have to pass on it and yeah. you know pe people like ash who like has his own what's up ash who has his own setup like it's a great like um near z in nashville um, they're, they're, and like Aaron has his own studio too. Like right. people that have their own drum studios now, they, they can work a yeah, lot. Like Mike, Mike so. Bennett, he's doing, he's doing a lot. Oh of yeah. Stuff. Mike, Mike too. Yeah. yeah. He's doing so a lot that's, of stuff. That's the one thing I can't do that. So I'm strictly programming for until further notice. So, yeah. um, not only that, like I have, I have like my little real feel pad and my sticks here, but, um, like I had the V, v drum kit in New York. That's what I was just going to ask you. Yeah. I remember when I was like. Because you and I were talking when I was still in New York, and you know, I I had everything I needed in the apartment there, but um, I was trying to get out here to be with my girl, and I remember like when I was packing up, look, and I didn't, I just got, I didn't know when I was going to be back, and I honestly don't know, I probably won't be back in New York for months, so um, I just said goodbye to the VK because I was like, that's the closest thing I I had to a, a kit to play for a while, so, mm. and now. Yeah, this is this is definitely the longest I've gone without actually playing a kit, and I think since I started playing when I was a kid. So. I, oh, my sample library. Well, I use for virtual live drums. I use XLN Audio Addictive Drums. I have their full library. I swear by it. Um, use it all the time. Um, but for everything else, like programming, just more electronic sounding shit, or like old school, like slices, you know, breakbeat sounds chopped up, that stuff, it's it's mostly my own stuff. But I have a thumb drive I travel with. It's all backed up on the cloud, and it's also on all my drives on my on my gear. But um, it's 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 just a huge sample library. It's it's it has stuff that I've transferred from floppy disk. From my first, you know, my MPC 60 to zip disks on my MPC 3000 to now everything's WAV files, and so I have, I have samples going back to the late 80s, and I still make samples now. So it's it's a huge library, but everything's pretty well organized in folders, and I have my go-to folders, and it's easy to in Pro Tools. I just do the shortcut for import audio, and I just scroll through, audition my sounds, and um, and it's. Whatever I have, if I need 808 sounds, I have folders of that, 909 sounds, folders of that, like dubstep sounds, what, whatever the genre. And then I have like like uh, exotic percussion, modern percussion, Brazilian percussion, African percussion. I just, I have like whatever sounds I need, it's always on there and I'm constantly updating it. Like every year, if there's some sounds, at least once a year, a producer will ask me to cop a vibe of something new and there'll be like a kick or a snare or some percussion sound that I don't have. So I either make it or I research it and find a library where I can get it. So there are certain libraries, like there's a company called Vengeance. I've bought a bunch of their sample packs, but I'll weed through it. Um, like Native Instruments Machine, I love the sample library it comes with, but I don't like machines programming architecture itself. So I don't really use machine itself, but I use the sounds all the time. I love Native Instruments sounds. So uh, Daniel, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, yeah, it's basically my own library, which is just, just a, a mesh of stuff, including a lot of sounds I've compiled over the years. He, he, 
he tours with some huge artists and you know these these are artists that do stadium and arena tours and he was like i don't know when we're going to be out on the road next no and he's like i don't know what it's going to look like and i was saying like it seems like the, the 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 way forward in the meantime is to just go into like center staging or sir in the big room set up your full stage production with lights and everything and just do streaming shows and do it in a way that makes it worthwhile where make it interactive so people will actually pay to watch it live. And I think, I think that's just going to be like what's happening. Um, Just the whole paradigm of people paying for music the way it was when we grew up. It's, it's just, that's kind of done. I mean, diehard fans will buy records to support the artist or if, if you love vinyl or that like having it at home i know you, you have vinyl that's a thing but but as far as like m- the way like the public at large consumes music now <coughs> it's it's streaming absolutely and um so i i think like just and when people say i'm dropping my single it's like well what does that mean like that used to mean you literally would press a 45 back in the day and have to like just get it distributed and um or i talked to somebody recently like yeah i got a distribution deal it's like well, what just distributing what like yeah. it's for most artists it's just you're you're just putting your shit online that's kind of what it is and and then yeah you can move some physical products but it's like I, the record business, I think is still like figuring out what it is now. Right. Um, but but the main thing is is people will always want to consume music. It's just like how you release it and in what form, and do you make your money from that or do you make your money from other things? So. Yeah. Well, I mean, with that, like the EAD is is a is a great tool for that. But honestly, the the best thing is just have a good have be a good drummer, have a good touch have a good sounding instrument and be in a good room. There's a guy named Mike Peel, who I also went to another Berkeley friend. I don't know if he's on now, but um, Mike, he does a great drummer, but he does, I guess, carpentry and he like, he's a craftsman, but he, he still plays drums and he's got some really cool old drums. And he, there's a boathouse, you know, for like rowing crew, there's a boathouse in New England, wherever he lives. I don't know where, maybe it's in Boston where I guess on the down season, they let him set a drums up there. And he recently posted a bunch of videos of him drumming. And he's got like, like this huge, like vintage Ludwig, like looks like a 28 inch kick or something. And an old superphonic and some funky Zildjian's and, and, um, the, just the room sound is massive and the drums sound beautiful. And I, and I left a comment on Instagram. I was like, is that just, the, the room or are you processing he said it's just my literally my iphone on a stand you're hearing the room straight into the iphone right. and right. it's like you know like producers would pay a fortune to, to be able to get that that sound on, on certain mm-hmm. records so um so yeah i think if, if you're lucky enough to have the, like a room where you can really get a great sound that's great but if you can't something like the ead or, or whatever there, there there are other ways you don't have to use the ad you can just you can have a you, you know, you can use whatever you, you can use one. You could just put a single 57 in the room and just process it through the right, right shit in your DAW and it'll, it'll still sound good. But there's, you know, there's always a way to make your shit sound good. So I've done records. I mean, I've recorded at like Power Station C and A, which are two legendary room sounds and other great studios in whatever, you know, any major city I've been in where I've worked at like the top studios there and um, each room has its character and a lot of it is also the engineer like um, in New York the stu- this, the three studios I've worked most at in the last 10 years were Monster Island my Caffrey studio which is no longer open unfortunately um, and then um, Mission Sound Oliver Strauss studio in Williamsburg which is that's with that uh, vintage blue sparkle lovely kit right I that's like my my home. I um, he's got my childhood. Gretsch kit is there. Um, 
he's just I that's the one place I can go and just show up with sticks because he's got an amazing drum. Is, it, is, is, is that the same guy that you, you you got the call that night and the guy wanted you to do like right away and you said yes. Y- y- that, I said I would do it with Oliver. Yep, yeah, yep, I, I, that I was, remember that. I remember that. I heard you on the phone. Yeah, that that artist ended up being this uh, singer named Normani, who's a big young pop R and B singer. But yeah, that was uh, that came through. And who owns Jungle City Studio, which is the other studio I work at a lot. But um, but really, the studio I work most at in New York is Mission, Oliver Strauss's place. And, you know, Oliver is a drummer himself. He's got a huge drum collection. I brought him to Zildjian with me where they let him handpick a bunch of cymbals. So he's got great cymbals. He's got the the, pic, the Acrolyte I'm holding in the picture you posted. That is actually his house Acrolyte. The other Acrolyte, the deeper one that I've used in a lot of records, is Mike Caffrey's from Monster Island. Mike's the guy that really turned me, got me into Acrolytes because I didn't, I was more of a superphonic guy for years until Mike got that Acrolyte when we were doing this Avril Lavigne record because I, I, I asked him to, he did, I, I wanted a deeper snare. I said, go by the bottom snare, it's six and a half inch superphonic. And he found the deeper Acrolyte, which is pretty rare. And he bought it. And, and I was a little skeptical. I was like, this is not going to be bright enough. And he said, just listen to it. And um, we mic'd it up and it sounded amazing. And, I, that kind of, since then, I'm just, I've been a hardcore Acrolyte guy. And I liked them before then, but really Mike's responsible for me becoming, like, so into Acrolytes. My dad was, was a dream come true. I mean, being a modern drummer was a dream come true. And um, and then being in Drumhead, like, mover, like with modern drummer, they tell you if you're going to be on the cover or not. And Billy Amendola, who's a good friend of mine, let me know. There, there's, I had a little bit of a... Of a there was some bad blood with Modern Drummer and me because of my association with Drumhead for a while. Um, because I guess they didn't want to feature somebody who was actively writing for a competing drum magazine. So, um, and there's some other stuff, but I think that's what it came down to. So after I had like stopped writing my column for Drumhead, Billy reached out to me and said, hey, we're going to do something on you. It's not going to be the cover, but it's going to be a good feature. And um, and it was really cool. So, I mean, it was very exciting. And then, um, and then Drumhead, Mover doesn't tell you you're going to be on the cover. He doesn't tell anybody if they're going to be on the cover. And um, so... This is what he's I, talking about. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I remember I found out on Facebook. It was a Sunday night. And um, I'm going through Facebook, and I see a post with that cover picture. And um, Mover posted, like, this month this month up issue yeah i had no idea it was going to be on the cover that was really so that that was like a su- really pleasant surprise and um and and you so george you've read that you know that's a much more in-depth feature where they really got into everything. how many how many pages i mean it's like 12 i don't know 12 pages something like that something i don't know it was, it was it's a huge big it's big it's yeah big. that was really cool so yeah i was honored to be in both and um and now it's like podcasts are kind of a new it seems like that's how podcasts are kind of taking over. Like the the print world is is slowly going away, and, and even like Modern Drummer has their own podcast. And I think right, right. it's 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 kind of the thing. So like every pod every drum podcast I've been on, including yours now, because this is it's not a podcast, but it's more. Yeah, I'm in the same. I'm I'm in this. I'm I'm in the same. Same world, thing, but it's just a yeah. Hang. So it's just a hang. yeah, but. You know? But yeah, I'm honored to be on all these things because, you know, it's like you're I'm in great company here. And with the first drum podcast I did was I'd hit that. I've done a couple episodes of that. Drummers Resource, 180 drum, is it Drums 180 or 180 Drums, um, Discussion and Percussion, uh, Robin Flans. I, I'm not, I'm forgetting some now, but I've done a lot of them. Did and, you do um, Seamus's yet? Did you do his? I, I haven't. I would love to be on it. Um, Seamus, so, yeah. if you're listening... Yeah. Zildjian signed me when I was still at Berkeley when I got that first gig with Iron Bullock. So I've been with Zildjian longer than anybody else. Um, Paul Francis, if you're watching, Paul is the guy that makes, he's been really cool and has like custom made me some shit that's amazing. Um, but everybody at Zildjian's amazing. Sarah, Emily, John to Christopher, who's no longer there, but signed me when I was a kid. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting people. I apologize. But, uh, um, Dylan Ludwig, who I've been playing since I was a kid, but I've only been endorsing for the last what is it, three, four, or five years. Um, but yeah, I I'm super happy to to be officially with Ludwig now after having 
been using them. My first, my first real snare when I was a little kid was Love League. So, um, and uh, Reflex Pads, I mentioned XLN Audio that makes addictive drums. Roland, who actually hooked me up with that V kit I have. Um, I give a lot of Roland shit. I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but oh, SKB cases. And if I'm forgetting anybody, I apologize. Oh, Sure and Mackie. Sure mics and headphones and Mackie monitors and interfaces. And uh, shout out to Judd at Guitar Center Pro. Any of my friends that, that need a hookup uh, with like um, a better level of service, it's kind of like a concierge thing. Like like you you just call Judd directly, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. and way, way below retail. So yeah. yeah. A shout out to Judd at Guitar Center and also Sweetwater, who also um, they're Sweetwater and, and Guitar Center Pro are slightly different things. So I get different things from each, but they're both great. They're both great. And, but Judd. Yeah. Oh, um, with with artists, not really. Um, but I get starstruck with people that you might not think I get. I would be starstruck around. But anybody that I was really into when I was coming up, like I'll be at a set. I could be in a studio and I'll walk in the hallway and a place like Jungle City, which is kind of like the the last of like the the glitzy like New York studios, like the Hit Factory used to be, like where you'd be in the lounge and like people would be coming in from different sessions. And so I could be at jungle city and you walk outside and there's Justin Timberlake hanging out in the lounge or Pharrell or Jay-Z, whatever. Um, it's, I don't get starstruck with anybody who's big now, but um, like I met Jelly B Johnson, the drummer from the time, and I could barely speak. It was kind of embarrassing. Or Greg Erico, who's actually a, a friend of mine. I've been friends with him for years. Every time I talk to him on the phone, I have to stop myself from fanboying out. So anybody that, that I was really into when I was a kid, um, I still get a lot of... I, and Annie Lennox, I wasn't starstruck when I worked with her, but I remember the first time, because when I started with her, we were just doing promo and playing TV, which is different from playing like a, a concert. But when we, then we did some, some shows, and our first show was, was in Europe, and it was like a, a, an outdoor amphitheater and we're playing the set and we go into Sweet Dreams, the rhythmic song, and then hearing her sing it in real time, hearing that voice, because I, you know, as a teenager when MTV first started. And so hearing her sing that, which is a part of like the soundtrack of, of my adolescence, that I, I was a little starstruck on stage playing that song with her. But aside from that, um, I want maybe Marcus Miller. Like, I remember he sat in with Hiram one day, and I was a little starstruck with him because I didn't really know him. And I was, he was the bass player on so much shit that, that I loved. But, no, I think the last two times I got really starstruck were uh, Jelly Bean Johnson. And, uh, and yeah, every time I talk to Greg Eric, I'll probably always be a little starstruck, even though we're, we're, we're friends. So. And, like, Danny Gottlieb and I both played on Lisa Maxwell's record. And I've known Danny over the years. But, yeah, there's certain times where somebody that was that influential – I, I guess I have like some reverence for them, but not necessarily starstruck. Right. Yeah, but yeah, definitely that thing where like I, I, I will always put certain people on a pedestal like that. Right. And oh, I forgot James Brown and Pete Townsend, two people that I did meet in the 90s when I was on. Uh, it was like festival things where we were all playing on the same show. And I remember like being outside of James Brown's dressing room with like, and I showed up with a picture for him to sign because I knew he was, I knew he, I knew he was there going to be there. Same thing with Pete Townsend. And um, yeah, anybody. Yeah. That was, I was that big a fan of. I, I, I won't go into the full story, but yeah. Um, people that I was playing with since junior high and high school, we all kind of like came up together and, it's like George was just saying, like, be cool, don't be a dick. It's like, be good at what you do, be reliable, and be cool. So everything, it's, it's really word of mouth at this point. Every, like, I haven't really auditioned for much ever. Um, the, the thing, all the, the most meaningful work I've gotten has just been word of mouth recommendations. So, um, so my first like gig with a, with a major label artist that I talked about earlier was Hiram Bullock. That came from being friends with a friend of his, who I played with at Berkeley, Lisa Maxwell. And then every gig after that, like Robert Washington Jr. came through uh, doing a gig, a one-off gig with Paolo Batista, his percussionist at the time. 
Um, and then Alicia Keys, you, uh, Katy Perry, that was through Lukash, Luke and Max Martin. Um, and I remember working with Luke and Max at Luke's apartment in, on 21st Street when he was still in New York. And there was a ba- it was a duplex. There was a basement. They would be writing music. They'd, Luke would call me over and say, we want you to program his NPC set up. They'd play me the song idea. They'd leave me with Pro Tools and an NPC that I would I would uh, let do my drums and come up and get them when I was done. And I remember one day I went upstairs and it was those guys and they were they were always taking meetings. And I come up and there's some very nondescript white girl, like um, just in the corner, very like soft spoken. They're like, oh, this is Katie. No idea she was gonna turn into Katy Perry, but. Yeah, and then maybe a year after that, I'm working on her debut record, and I, I had no idea that was going to blow up. Um, and um, Alicia Keys, Alicia Keys came through recommendations. Um, well, I had worked with, so I mentioned Anne, who owns Jungle City, who's Alicia's longtime engineer and production coordinator. And I don't know if they credit Anne as a producer, but I, she, she does do a lot of production for Alicia. So. Um, <coughs> I had worked with Anne previously when she was an assistant at Forget What Studio years ago. And then we worked again on a Bo Bice. I don't know if you remember him. He was an American Idol guy record. And so Anne knew me and Alicia was looking for um, for new musicians for just like 2009 or 2010. And so uh, Art, Artie Smith, uh, drum tech to the stars, he's been, he, Artie is, he's, Steve Jordan's longtime tech, but has worked with everybody and has an amazing vintage and new gear collection. Um, Artie lives in Florida now, and he'll come to New York when he needs to. And, and I think last time Jordan toured with John Mayer. Artie's claim to fame is he's only done two tours. He did the expensive wino tours, teching for that with Steve Richards, um, with Steve Jordan and Charles Drayton. And then he just it's like you can't afford Artie because he's so busy, like in the studio. He's he's worked with everybody. He's a legend. Um, but Steve Jordan also doesn't tour as a drummer often anymore. So um, when he did the last tour he did with John Mayer, they brought Artie out for that. But Artie was friends with, with Alicia and Anne, and so when they were looking for drummers, I'm pretty sure it was Artie who said my name, and maybe somebody else. But Anne, and but because Anne, I. Anne and I knew each other, again, word of mouth, we had worked together, she knew me, and um, and then I, Alicia wanted to check me out and have me come in, and there was this whole process they wanted to go through, I won't go into it now, and I was busy, I couldn't do it when she was available, so, so Anne just said, come in, Alicia won't be there, but we'll work, you mean Artie, and we're going to record a bunch of stuff and I'll play it for her, and then I get a text like a day later, like AK, which is what she refers to as, AK loves your shit. Uh, she wants to do the record. So that's how Alicia started. And then through Alicia um, and Anne owning Jungle City, she has a bunch of other engineers there. And one of them is, is Stuart White or Stu White, depending on, I think he goes by Stu now. But anyway, Stu is a great engineer. And it was through that initial Alicia Key stuff that like Stu called me to work on Beyonce's record. And again, word of mouth. And um I've done other stuff with Stu, and it's, it goes the other way too. Like uh, Stu's a great mix engineer, and I, there, there are a handful of people that I always recommend. People who are like, I need a mix engineer. Like, uh, I just have a list of like the first call engineers, and Stu's one of them. So it, yeah, we all recommend each other for shit. And um, who else? I don't know. Uh, Aretha also came through the Jungle City connection. That Babyface was producing that. They needed a drummer. <laughs> and and called me to do that. So yeah, it's to, that's a really long answer to your question, Christopher. But uh, but yeah, it's it's, it's a great it's, it's, it's a great question. I love I love I love I love I love hearing. But, but yeah, and like Annie Lennox, which is the first pop tour I did, um, and she, and Annie, Annie's still big, but like in the '90s, she was like number one on the charts internationally. That came through word of mouth through my friend Paul Pesco. I don't know if Paul's watching. Paul has had an amazing career, still has an amazing career. He's not a drummer, but George, he'd be a great guy for you to talk to just because his resume is unbelievable. And he's another guy that, like, a lot of people, when I'll mention his name, they'll be like, yeah, I think I know that name. But when you when you hear everything he's done, then you know who, who he is. And you've probably seen him because you've ever watched Live from Daryl's House. Paul was MDing Hall & Oates for a while after T-Bone passed. 
Absolutely. Um, so he did all that stuff. But yeah, Paul's worked with everybody. He got me on the Annie Lennox gig. I did a share record through the Annie Lennox gig because Annie's producer was Steve Lipson, was producing Share while I was in London, had me play on that. Ash does a lot of stuff with Steve Lipson now. Um, but yeah, everything is just like word of mouth and just comes down to like be good at what you do, be reliable, and don't be a dick. Yeah. Berkeley. Um, a few things. I mean, the Hiram gig, again, through being at Berkeley, playing in a big band where Lisa heard me <coughs> play drums. And I think also I, I've heard, I read, she, she did an interview. She was doing a lot of press for her big band record. And I think she said something about when she met me, because if you saw me at Berkeley, you would not think I was a fusion drummer. And um and that Todd said something like he he saw me play some fusion recitals when we were at Berkeley, because Todd 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 and I weren't there for long at the same time, but we were there for at least a semester together. And um, but yeah, if you saw me back then, I had like a really long mullet with different colors in my hair, pierced ears, it was pre tattoos, but I dressed like a metalhead and I was wearing like tight like stretch jeans and I, I had like i would buy two pairs of reebok high tops blacks and whites and i would mix them set up one black shoe one white shoe and um <clears throat> yeah it looked like a metal head but i was mostly playing jazz and fusion and um and um yeah so i think that was part of it a couple people have said you know like somebody commented to me said you know you had the image thing together back then which i didn't think of it like that it's just like i just always had like my own sense of style and um but i think that i think that probably played into it as well like i think lisa said like part it wasn't that i was like the best big band drummer she ever heard especially at berkeley you know i, I was an adequate big band drummer and i could sight read which was cool but i think seeing somebody that looked like me playing big band was probably stuck out more than if i had just been like a, like somebody who looked like every other jazz drummer there so i think that's part of it so but yeah so getting getting my first like break and also my first endorsement with Zildjian all from being a, from meeting somebody while I was at Berkeley meeting Lisa and then also Tommy Campbell who George you you've heard me go off about Tommy Campbell and he he was a mentor to me and um the best thing Tommy really did for me was he used to let me go shed with him and he let me set up his drums like basically I, I would he would it was kind of a mentor thing like he would like let me hang out with him. He had two kids in his room. He wouldn't charge me. We could just practice together. And, um, and then I, would, I was honored to like carry his drums and set them up and break them down for him because I got to sit and like get the best seat in the house sitting right behind the kit and watch him play, play shows. And um, I remember on one of these gigs, he, he asked, the, the, I forget which artist he was working with. He was like, can my boy sit in? And that was it. Like, that was my first time playing with, like, like, it was a sink or swim situation. Because all of a sudden, like, I get there and they call whatever song. It was a jazz standard, but they, they're like, okay, we're going to do it 9-8 or 7-8. I forget, but it was just like, and they count it off and that's it. And you can't fuck up. Like I said, as a drummer, you got to be able to hang. So doing that did so much for my confidence. Like him having that faith in me. And also I remember him giving me a, like publicly complimenting me to one of his peers saying, Oh, this is a guy to watch out for. And, um, specifically, I remember he said, this is Steve Wolf. He's a bad motherfucker. And I remember that blew my mind. I was like, my, one of my drum idols just called me a bad motherfucker to somebody he works with. And, um, you know, like I said, I was, I was a very like melancholy kid coming up and, and like, we've talked about imposter syndrome. So like, ha like that, yeah. That 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 that, just, just that in itself probably was one of the best things that came out of Berkeley was that. But then also like I mentioned Dave DeLong who I joined Hiram's band with, like so many amazing musicians that I'm still good friends with today that I still work with today all came from being being at Berkeley. So like I knew going into it I wasn't going to graduate. I wasn't looking to get a degree. Um I wanted to to just meet great people and play with great people and I did that and then along the way it I got this great experience playing and like I said, being validated by one of my heroes did a lot for my confidence, which, you know, you, I can't say enough about like what, what a helpful thing that was for me, especially at that point in my life. So yeah, a lot of great things. And yeah, and Powell, like meeting people like Powell, like I'm 
there's a whole, you know, drummers are a community. And so there's so many great drummers I went to, to Berkeley with that we're still tight today. Mm-hmm. Brian Tishy, I don't know if Brian's watching. He's another guy you should have on. Brian is just a fucking beast. He's, to, for my money, the best living rock drummer right now. So, um, but yeah, so many great people I went, went, went to Berkeley with. So it was a kind of thing where, like, I was told, don't, when you get to New York and you start doing sessions, don't announce that you went to berkeley it's kind of because they, they look at berkeley as a factory and they're gonna look down at you but now berkeley's had this resurgence where it's kind of cool to, to graduate from berkeley and i there's a new generation of people i know that are like huge names now in the production world that they they are very public about like having been to berkeley so yeah but berkeley was cool and the other thing i got out of it was just the, the chance to be working so much playing all day every day and now it's easier there because they have backline drum kits in all the practice rooms and rehearsal rooms but back then i'd be packing my kit up lugging it from room to room and throughout a day at school i might be in a recording session at the berkeley studio i might be playing a recital i might be doing an ensemble rehearsal and then at night i might do back-to-back gigs with an original artist and then like a cover band and like that just really gets your playing together when you when you're just in so many situations like playing all kinds of music with high level musicians um and because there's somebody i forget who it was their kid they, they live in new york and they're like my kid wants to go to berkeley i'm like well you live in new york city like you don't really need to go to berkeley to get that and i mean there, there's there are so many clubs you can see great musicians the best drummers in the world every night and even though the music scene in New York isn't what it used to be, well, right now there's no music scene. But pre-pandemic, like the, you you could work all the time. So, and there, if you really want to study, you can get lessons with anybody there. And there's all much collective. But if you're not living in New York or a city like that, then Berkeley is, is, is good for that. But I think Berkeley is like prohibitively expensive. Days. So it's like if you like I mean you, you took a lesson with Dave Elich like Elich's opinion is it's bullshit like don't don't waste your money oh, yeah. and I I totally get where he's coming from too so um, it was good for me I didn't want to graduate I didn't graduate I got what I needed out of it and made lifelong friends the downbeat was more like a 60s kind of yeah so. Um, I mean, if you really want to get into specifics, how to how I like to tune toms, I never thought about it. I learned to tune drums when I was so young, but like only in the last few years, I actually figured out the the, the harmonic ratios. Like um, I always tune the, the bottom head a minor third above the top head, the batter head. And I I like to, if I'm using two toms, I usually tune them to a fourth or fifth apart. And then if the toms are going to be open, I will tune them to the key of the song. And um, and the snare, and even when I'm programming, I'll t- anything that, that has a ring to it, I'm going to tune either to the root or the fifth of the track, because I, I want everything to kind of ring. And I've talked about this before in interviews with uh, that song, Wrecking Ball, the Miles Cyrus song. Luke had already programmed the drums. I layered some live drums on top of that, and um, Artie Smith flew in for that set me up like a big Bon MS kit with a six and a half superphonic, which is what Luke wanted. And even though I was only going to be playing kick and snare, like doubling the electronic kick and snare, we set up a back, like a 14 inch rack and 16 and 18 inch floor toms a la Bonham. And we tuned to ring in the key of the song. So, so when I hit the kick and the snare, you hear the three toms ringing in unison and they're all tuned to either a root or a fifth of the key of the song. So, you just hear like the ambience in the key of the song. So I don't know if that answers your question, Christopher, but just, yeah, I, I tune, I tune them to the, to, to the song. And also am I using single headed toms or double headed toms? That's a whole other thing, which you don't have time to get into, but yeah. Uh, le- just learn to tune drums, use your ears. It's not rocket science. Um, learn to learn, learn to hear the ratio between what the resident head does on the bottom and the batter head. But yeah, if you want an easy thing to go to, you want to get, um, and I've done this with you, George, online when you got your club dates, um, you, you want to cover up, and I learned this from when I had to, like, back in the, now when I played symphony, which is not that often anymore, but I was classically educated, and back in the day playing symphony, there weren't the pedals where you could just move the, where it automatically get to the, to the pitch, 
you actually had to like tune the drum and you had you would have like a tuning fork and or like this little pitch pipe and you had and you you found a way to kind of like hit the drum with like do this thing where you could get the, the fundamental tone of the head but with double headed drums you got to cover up the other head so you can just hear the main head you're tuning and you tap around the edge of the head and you make sure all your tension rods are tuned in unison if you want like a unison sound and then from there for me to get the most resonant sound of the drum i it, it always ends up being about a minor third above the resonant head is a minor third above the top head but there's no rules some people tune the top head higher some people tune both heads to the same pitch and um some people like to detune one of the one of the lugs so you, you get a little bit of a wobble and um yeah there, there's no rules and then when you muffle stuff that affects everything too and um I was about to say something else about tuning toms, but I forgot what I was going to say, so it just doesn't matter. But, um, yeah, this, this we could talk for hours just about tuning and approaches to tuning. So, oh, I, oh, I was going to say, also, toms have a sweet spot. And the reason I use Evan's e, the, the UV heads is because they, they do something. I don't know what it is, but they, they, they broaden the sweet spot range. So certain toms, like, you only have, like, a certain range of pitches where the drum really sings. But any time I would take, especially difficult, like certain older drums are like a little out of round, they're a little difficult to tune. When I first time I used UV1 heads, and now they have UV2, but um, I noticed immediately they, they would like really expand the, the, the tunable range of, of every drum I use them on. So that's another thing. I don't know what heads you use, Christopher, but I highly recommend for Tom's the, the Evans UV heads. UV2s, if you want a thicker two ply vibe which is a little warmer, or if you want a little more resonance, uh, uh, UV1 single ply head. It's definitely not necessary. So, um, yeah. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to... Is there any... Is there... Yeah, as I was going to say, guys, this is... this is. Thank you for the... For, this is the maiden voyage of, of this, and I, wa I really yeah. want to thank Wolf for being the, the first one on here. I mean, there were some bumps. Honor, honor, to, honor to be here, George. Yeah, it's, so, uh, there were yeah. some bumps getting getting here, you know, and trial and error. You got you, you yeah. to suck first, and there's nothing... Wolf has a real good... You, you got to... You, you got to suck story. I can't remember if he, if he remembers what it is, but there's a... You got to suck first, and I did. I messed up three yeah. or four of these interviews or these things. Oh yeah. You got, you got, you got to fail. Like nobody who's great hasn't failed. And, uh, Billy man, who I mentioned before, he is a quote. I don't know if he made it up, but I've heard him use it, which is dare to suck. Like you, you know, dare to suck. So yeah, you have to, you got to put it out there. Um,